Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce Dr. Emil Sitke, professor at the University of Chicago. So he is an expert in CT reconstruction, has been working for a very long time in the fields of inverse problems and iterative CT reconstruction. Lately, he started also looking into deep learning based reconstruction techniques. And this is also one of the many reasons you would invite him in order to give a presentation here with our group. So uh, Dr. Sitke is a research professor in the Department of Radiology of the University of Chicago. He received his bachelor's degree in 1988 in physics, astronomy physics and mathematics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He went on to obtain a master's degree in 1991 and a PhD in 1993 in physics from the University of Chicago. Dr. Sitke worked as a postdoctoral research assistant in atomic physics at the University of Copenhagen from 1993 to 1996 and the University of Bielefeld in 1996 and Kansas State University from 1996 to 2001. In 2001, Dr. Sitke switched to medical imaging and joined the lab of Dr. Shaoshuan Pan. Most recently, he was promoted to research professor in 2018. Dr. Sitke has published approximately 100 papers and about 70 of them are in medical imaging. His theoretical work has mainly focused on X-ray tomography with sparse or limited angle sampling. He also applied advanced techniques for a non-smooth or non-convex large optimization applied to imaging. His application work has centered on tomographic breast imaging, CT and tomosynthesis, and developing image reconstruction algorithms and calibration techniques for spectral CT scanners based on photon counting detectors. So today I am glad to announce that we will be giving a talk entitled Inverse Problems in Imaging and Evidence for Solution by Convolutional Neural Networks. Emil, it's a great pleasure to have you here as a guest, at least virtually, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me for uh, giving and giving me this opportunity to speak to your group. So what I want to talk about today is uh, work that we did together with uh, two researchers from um, actually uh, University of Illinois. It's actually Illinois Institute of Technology. Sorry, Oban and Iris. But anyway, Iris is the PhD student and um, that we worked with and Yovan is uh, another researcher in medical imaging, who's very knowledgeable on neural networks. And then you can also see Xiao Chuan, that's my boss. All right. Anyway, this work was motivated by um, uh, recent efforts and um, that we've seen in the literature where you have claims that uh, deep learning with uh, CNN-based neural networks um, can solve ill-posed inverse problems. So here you can see the first line in the abstract of this paper from transactions image processing. In this paper, we propose a novel deep convolutional neural network based algorithm for solving ill-posed inverse problems. So um, yeah, we've seen lots of these papers, but when we look inside, we don't really see the evidence that this is actually happening. I mean, we see a lot of nice images, but the evidence for um, actually solving the inverse problem seems to be lacking. So this prompted us to do our own investigation. And we just um, uh, finished a paper last year, which is called Do CNN Solve the CT Inverse Problem? All right. And so this is pretty much um, what I'm going to explain today in this talk is like what's uh, some um, motivation and in, in introducing 
this work and showing our effort here in trying to see if CNNs do solve the CT inverse problem. So here's the outline for the talk. First, I'm going to uh, give some background on inverse problems. Then I'm going to talk about sparse view CT inverse, the sparse view CT inverse problem and compressive sensing. And the reason why I'm going to talk about that is because that's what uh, this paper here was using as their test subject as sparse view CT. Then I'll show some numerical results that uh, illustrate how um, we can show using compressive sensing that we can solve the sparse view CT inverse problem. And then we're gonna move on to some CNN numerical results and discuss finally the evidence that CNN, um, you know, for CNN solution of the sparse view CT inverse problem. So let's start from the beginning and uh, let's talk about the background on inverse problems. So all the material that I'm talking about here, you can pretty much find in more detail um, on these notes by Guillaume Ball. Um, it's a uh, class notes entitled Introduction to Inverse Problems. Guillaume Ball is a, he's a, a professor here at the, U Chicago, at the University of Chicago in the stats department. All right, so here we're just going to start at a very high level. All right, so when you're talking about inverse problems, um, what you're really doing is you're making a math mod mathematical model for some sort of measurement process. And the inverse problem is um, how do you estimate the parameters of that model from the data that you have, or you know, basically inverting your measurement model. So at a high level, we just represent the measurement model by this equation where you have some data Y, which um, is modeled by this operator M and depends on some parameters X. Okay, so if you want to invert this model, um, the first thing you need to establish is what's called injectivity, where you want to um, know that the model is one-to-one. -one. Namely, like if you have two uh, sets of data um, that are equal, then necessarily the set of parameters that led to those data are also equal, all right? So if you have two sets of parameters that give you the same data, you know right away that there's no way you're going to be able to derive an inverse for this model. Oh, yeah, by the way, if you have any questions, just uh, pipe up and uh, maybe the moderators could also just let me know if somebody asked a question. All right. Um, okay, so once you establish injectivity, then it makes sense to see if you can uh, drive an inverse. And so... What the inverse does is just takes your data, you apply the M inverse, and you get back the parameters that generated this data. Okay, so in most situations for inverse problems, you have some kind of a perturbing or uh, effect like noise or imperfect modeling. All right, so another useful concept for um, inverse problems is stability of the inverse. All right, so after you have this inverse, then it makes sense to establish stability of your inverse. So that's sort of captured in this inequality that you have here, which is saying that the um, inverse applied to two different data sets, the difference here should be less than uh, some function, some monotonic function of the uh, magnitude of the difference between the data itself the two different data sets. And so usually you take this monotonic function to be something linear and you have some kind of a parameter epsilon that you can hopefully prove that, you know, this difference will be less than this difference, right? And if that's the case, then you can say your inverse is stable. All right, so that's sort of the inverse problems in a nutshell. So let me just... Um, uh, explain, all right, now what happens when you apply an inverse to real data? Okay, so in this situation, you can consider a more physical measurement model, which we might not really know what it is, you know, um, but we can just sort of uh, suppose that it is 
the sum of these three components, your idealized model, some deterministic function, which sort of uh, captures unmodeled physics in your model and a noise component, all right? And um, hopefully these two terms here are small so that when you apply the inverse of your, that you derive for this idealized model, then you're gonna get your set of parameters plus some small error, delta, all right? But the smallness of delta depends on two things. First, you have to know that M inverse applied to M is gonna actually invert your model, right? That's important, right? And then you also have to have stability. So the stability here will ensure that, you know, some small deviation, um, you know, uh, from the ideal data is not gonna result in a huge uh, difference in the estimated parameters, all right? So the only thing that involves any sort of solving here is developing this inverse. So when you say you're solving an inverse problem, this is what you're talking about here. You have some idealized measurement model and you propose an inverse and you show that that inverse applied to the measurement model is gonna get the, exactly the parameters that generated that data, all right? So sometimes, uh, um, you know, in, uh, inverting um, or inverting uh, inverse problems or, um, you know, measurement models, people are talking about this step where you apply the, an idealized inverse to some physical model, right? This is not an inverse here, all right? You'll never, if you apply M minus one to M phys, you're never going to get back your your estimated data. This here is solving the inverse problem, all right? So, um, all right, so that's inverse problems in real data. So finally, one more thing I wanna talk about is ill-posed inverse problems, all right? So what is an ill-posed inverse problem? So there's a couple of things that can go wrong with uh, inverse problems. You might not have injectivity, all right? So it just could be that like two different data set or two different parameter sets will give you the same data. Then you have no hope to invert model, all right? You might have injectivity, but you might not have stability, all right? And if you don't have stability, you, you know, that's also not a great situation because you might be able to um, invert your model, but any small perturbation to the data is gonna completely mess up your parameter estimate. So then what do you do when you have an ill-posed inverse problem? You have to impose some sort of restriction. So basically you restrict, your, you put some restriction on the set of possible parameters that gen generate the data, all right? And so this is one way, for example, to um, get around this issue, all right? Is that, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have a situation where two parameter sets are leading to the same data, then, you know, maybe you should just consider your measurement model on a restricted set of, per, of uh, parameters. And we'll see this in action in the, in the rest of the talk. So when you see this claim that uh, deep learning solves ill-posed inverse problems, not only is the claim that you're inverting the measurement model, but it's also using the data to somehow find this restriction. So that's quite a tall order there. You have to find the right restriction on the parameter set and you also have to give the inverse. So that's, you know, that's a really strong claim, all right? So um, any questions up to this point? Because uh, here I've uh, covered like all the general theory that I wanted to talk about and then we're gonna get into the specific specifics of CT. No? All right, all right, we're moving along then. Oops. All right, so I'm gonna uh, specialize now on CT. So I assume everybody in the group's familiar with, with CT, right? Everybody does this. So basically your data model is um, just line integration over the attenuation map. 
And these line integrals can be arranged in multiple ways. So the most common way in 2D is the circular um, fan beam transform where your X-ray source goes all the way around the object and you illuminate the object with a fan of X-rays, right? And if you have a complete set of data, you can do invert this data using filtered back projection and get the image. In 3D, um, you, the most common configuration is circular cone beam. So instead, you, again, you have the circular trajectory, but instead of the fan, now you have a full cone um, illuminating the, the whole object volume, and you do reconstruction from that. Okay. When we do uh, image reconstruction using iterative methods or even deep learning, the model that we're actually using is an, an algebraic model for CT. So the most common algebraic model is sort of illustrated here. Um, so you discretize the image. You already also have discrete data because the sampling is digital. And so you turn um, those uh, continuous line integrals um, into just a humongous linear system where X is a matrix representing the uh, action of forward projection. F is your pixelized image, but it's actually considered to be a vector here. And G is a vector containing all the data elements. So the matrix elements of X are kind of illustrated here. So if you take the nth pixel, and, and consider a line intersection with the nth ray contributing to G. You have this red line here and the length of that red line, that's your matrix element, All right? So this is a very convenient model for implicit estimation. And implicit estimation is great um, for situations where you have unusual sampling configurations or you wanna model even more complex physics than just the line integration. All right, so let's consider a sparse view um, arrangement. All right, so here I have like a test object that I'm gonna be using in the simulations later. And um, it's uh, just a model of a breast basically. So the, the round white line, that's a skin line. And then the dark gray tissue, that's fatty tissue and the wider tissue inside is fibroglandular tissue. But this phantom is defined on a 512 by 512 image grid. And here's just a blow up of one of the regions. All right, so the sampling configuration I'm gonna consider here is 128 fan beam projections over 360 degrees, all right? So now if we consider our measurement model, G equals XF. Because we only have 128 fan beam projections, the size of the data is four times less than the size of the image, all right? So what that means is that uh, you have an underdetermined linear system. And so there's a non-trivial null space to this uh, matrix X. And for sure, this model is not injective, all right? Um, because you can just take any of those non-trivial null vectors, add it to a solution F, and then you can get the same data from it, All right? So one way to deal with this is uh, the compressive sensing approach. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with this because, um, you know, it just shows how you deal with an ill-posed problem. And uh, the numerical studies here sort of will illustrate what I mean by giving evidence for solving inverse problems. And this also establishes a measurement model for our undersampling in CT that we can use as a, as a reference to test the CNN approach. All right, so the first issue um, that we are gonna address is the measurement model restriction, right? So this is a, an old idea. Right, uh, for, well, now it's old, right? It's a uh, 15 years old idea that, um, you know, you should exploit sparsity if you want to do undersampled image reconstruction. So here I have an image of a chest CT and you can see this image is not sparse at all. But if I take the gradient magnitude image of this, uh, 
this slice, you can see that all the non-zeros are pretty much at the edges of the tissues. And this image is sparse, all right? So we wanna consider this restricted measurement model where we have a G equals XF as before, but we're not only gonna allow F to be in the set of gradient sparse images, all right? So the question is, is this model injective or not? All right, it's not obvious at all, you know? Um, and so that's why I put the question mark here. And this is something though that we can test. All right, so in compressive sensing, we have this uh, measurement model where um, we're restricting the images to be in uh, sparse in some transform domain. And so this norm here, this L0 norm, this is what's called the counting norm. It just counts the number of non-zeros and restricts this to be less than some number S, right? So if this is injective, then we can uh, make an implicit definition of a model inverse, namely just find of all the images that agree with the data, find the one that's the sparsest in this transform domain, all right? So mathematically, this problem is, is very difficult to solve because of the L0 norm. It's a um, highly non-convex problem. So then another important component to compressive sensing is to relax this model to the L1 norm. It's also a difficult optimization problem, but it's convex. And like over the last 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of nice methods developed to solve this problem. And so uh, this is the proposed model inverse for this measurement model that we're going to study. All right. So another complication, though, when you're studying compressive sensing for inverse problems is that there's only mathematical proof for very few sensing models. They usually involve some kind of random sampling matrix. And so you can find out about it in this uh, nice article, An Introduction to Compressive Sampling by Candace and Waken. Um, and so the CT model's not there, all right? And so what do we do? We have to, we do a physics style approach. We just sort of take a guess that that model inverse is gonna work. First of all, that the model's injective and the proposed model inverse is going to work. And then we try to establish numerical evidence that, um, that we're solving the, the restricted measurement model for compressive sensing. All right. So this is not as good as a proof, right? But at least, you know, we can do some investigation and try to establish this model or the, this model inverse. All right. So we do lots of numerical studies where we're gonna solve this optimization problem. The algorithm we use is this primal dual um, algorithm from Shamble Pak, I'm not gonna get into it, but um, basically what we're gonna do is just do lots of studies solving this equation, right? So um, this is, uh, these are images of the test object that we're gonna use. So remember I showed you the breast phantom before. So uh, we are going to use this phantom because we know it's sparse in the gradient, you know. So you have a complex um, structure, you can see that, but it's um, pretty much bimodal, at least in this top row. And so if you took a, the gradient magnitude image, then uh, it would be very sparse. We're also going to consider a smooth edge model where we just blur this model a little bit so, so we can test the sparsity a little bit. All right, so this phantom is also stochastic. So you can see I've given you three realizations of it, but I can generate as many as I'd like. And this is important for the deep learning part of the study. All right, so we can generate tons and tons of training data for when we get to the CNN part. All right, um, and so now we're gonna see test this uh, Model. So what the way we do these tests is a so-called inverse crime studies, where we use consistent noiseless data generated from the test object. This is really the only way to test the proposed model inverse, because remember, we're going for equality here. We want to recover the phantom exactly. That establishes evidence for a model inverse. 
So there's also another side benefit, though, for doing these kind of studies. It's actually a really tough test on your computer implementation of the algorithm. You know, so if you if you're doing reconstruction from noisy or inconsistent data, there's a lot of artifacts anyway. So if there's some small error in the code, it's actually kind of hard to see. But with this kind of test, um, any small error, you'll know it, you know, uh, you'll see for sure. All right, so let me move on to one of the tests. So here I took an example of binary phantom and ran the shambo poc algorithm on it. And this is the result here. And here's a blow up of the result. And I'm not showing the phantom next to it because it looks exactly the same. In fact, in order to see a difference between the reconstruction and the truth, you have to go down to a really narrow grayscale uh, window, which is on the level of 10 to the minus seven, right? And so this, here we're running into basically numerical precision issues. And so if you go to a 1% window, you don't see any difference at all. So here's a smooth edge phantom. Um, you can see in the ROI that's a little bit blurrier because that's the nature of the phantom. But still to see a difference from the truth, you have to go to a super narrow window. Not quite as narrow as the other one, but uh, still you know, down to the 10 to the minus six level, right? All right, so then uh, let's get into a little bit more uh, details on uh, now the evidence for uh, compressive sensing solving the inverse problem. So recall the proposed inverse is given by this optimization problem where we're finding the minimum image total variation such that the image agrees with the available data. And this is the measurement model, all right? So uh, it's uh, G equals XF and we're restricting F to be GMI sparse. All right, so here I have a graph of a bunch of convergence curves. So uh, the blue and the green one are convergence criteria. For this optimization problem, I'm not gonna get into it. Um, the black curve is the error in the data. So the difference between XF and G. And here's the image RMSE in the red curve. So the first three curves here basically tell us that we're solving this problem. And that's it, all right? So that this problem actually is providing the inverse to this measurement model, that evidence is given by this red curve, all right? So that's our evidence. So it's possible, for example, that the first three curves would go tend towards zero and then the red curve wouldn't. In that case, we're solving the problem, but we're not inverting the measurement model, all right? So what could possibly go wrong here, all right? The first thing is you fail to solve this problem, all right? If you don't solve this problem, then you don't have a uh, guess at your inverse to test. So another thing that can happen is that your, your model for the inverse isn't correct. You know, it's not actually gonna measure, invert this measurement model. And then the third thing is that the measurement model itself might not be injected. So these two things are different. You know, it's possible that this measurement model is injective, but this proposed inverse isn't correct. It's not going to invert this model. So, um, yeah, specifically compressive sensing, we know that the, the better inverse is to minimize the L0 norm of the gradient. And so you'll see a lot of work in the literature where people try to approximate the L0 norm in order to gain that little bit of uh, space that's left between this convex model and the, non the ideal non-convex model. All right, so when you do numerical simulation though, it's not really possible to tell the difference between these two. You'll see that the image RMSC just doesn't go to zero, um, but you don't know if that's because your inverse is bad or because the measurement model is um, not injective. All right, and so this like gets us to this topic here. So there's limitations on empirical studies. We never really um, achieve the exact solution. You can see that here, you know, because we're doing iterations, right? 
And so ideally, all these, these curves should be, go to zero, right? But you, you have only a finite amount of time. So um, you never really do get to zero. So it is possible that, you know, maybe in the millionth iteration, everything levels off, right? And so, um, you know, that's why, you know, we can never say mathematically for sure that we're solving inverse problem. But say we have a little doubt, we can just always push further. Get a computer with more numerical precision, you know? Um, you can have those things. And then also we can only test one object at a time, all right? So the measurement model is involving all images that are sparse on the gradient magnitude image. Well, there's no way you're gonna test all of them, right? Um, so we, all we can do is just take them one at a time and see if we get an inverse. And that's how you establish end, um, evidence. All right, so any questions up to this point? So I'm gonna leave the compressive sensing stuff and then go on to the CNNs. Good. All right, so at this point, so the, um, yeah, Jovan and Iris, they, they came to us to see if uh, um, we could do some studies together on using CNNs to solve the sparse view um, CT problem. So they uh, picked up a CNN architecture from this paper, frame, framing UNET uh, via deep convolutional frameworks application to sparse view CT, all right? And we're doing the same problem, 128 view uh, sinograms, and we're trying to reconstruct a 512 by 512 image. And so way, the way this works is that uh, you first do the filtered back projection on the 128 view sinogram. You have the artifact um, full image, and you learn the difference between the FVP image and the truth. And so then you basically are learning the artifacts in the FBP so that when you get a new FBP image, you can just subtract those artifacts and get the truth, all right? So, um, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about uh, specifics on deep learning, so don't ask me about all the architecture stuff. That's uh, probably you guys know that much better than I do. Um, but I can tell you what we did for the experiment. So. We basically generated 4,000 image data pairs from that model that I showed you of the breast phantom. And Iris uh, did training with 80% of that data and uh, left 20% for validation and 10 images were held out completely for testing. All right. So let me move on here. So let me show you the results for the binary. Um, test object. So here I have on the right, the uh, old total variation result that I showed you before, uh, demonstrating an inverse. And here's the result for the CNN prediction. So this column here is the input to the neural network. All right, so you can see the very streaky FBP image. And if you blow up on this ROI, you can see the, you know, the the image is quite noisy looking. In fact, there's no noise here. The reason why it looks like that is because the edge structure is so complicated that the streaks from the 128, the undersampling has the appearance of noise at this level. All right, the CNN prediction is given right here. So on the global scale, it looks pretty decent. On the local scale, it's very good. Um, but you can definitely notice some differences. So here I'm using the TV recon as uh, truth because it's all pre pretty much indistinguishable. So you can see there's this little thing here that's not over here. There's some differences in the edges, all right? And if you look at the difference image in the 1% window, you know, mo most everywhere it's okay, but there's definitely um, noticeable differences at the edges of the structures. And in any case, we can definitely clearly see a difference. So we don't have inversion here, all right? Let's go to the smooth edge phantom. <clears throat> um, a very similar situation. It's just that in the, on the local scale, you can see the streak structure looks a little different in the FBP. And, you know, the prediction is actually fairly decent. 
but there's some small error, right? And you can see this in the 1% um, window. All right, so here's another important test, all right, that maybe a normal uh, deep learning people wouldn't do. Um, but um, if you're talking about inverting an inverse problem under these ideal conditions, that means if you put in an image from the training set, you should get also back exactly the, the, the corresponding truth image for that training data. And so that's what we're doing here for both the binary and smooth um, images. So this, uh, this pair right here is, is actually in the training set. And so if you put the FBP image, you in fact do not get back exactly the truth image, all right? The RMSC is lower. So like for this binary phantom, when it went, the RMSC for the test set was like at a 10 to the minus three. And so we uh, reduced the RMSC by about 25%, but this should also be zero here. You should have a ac completely accurate recovery. And the same for the smooth edge phantom. All right, so here's another interesting test. So we had 10 uh, testing images. So what I did here is take all CNN projections of those 10 test images and just took a window, 24 pixels by 24 pixels, scanned it over each of the images and looked for the ROI that gave me the worst error or the worst prediction. So this is really the worst case um, ROI over all 10 Five by 12 by 5, 12 images. And here you have the truth phantom for both binary and smooth edge and the CNN prediction here in the middle and the difference. And you can see here, like in the, and it's interesting, by the way, for both sets of phantoms, the this uh, search ended up with the same ROI. So it's probably not too surprising. But in any case, here's the truth and here's the prediction. And you can see like you have this object here which appears in the prediction that you don't have here in the binary. But on the other hand, you know, this is pretty decent. You know, most of the structure here is recognizable and this is the worst case ROI. So it's a very difficult test, you know? So it maybe it gives you hope that, you know, it's possible that the CNNs can actually do this inverse, but here's, this is not evidence for it because there's definitely a zero, non-zero difference, right? So let's look at some metrics here for this uh, CNN training. So on the left here, I have um, the, the loss function that's being used for the actual training of the neural network. Uh, so it's a mean square error. And so the blue curve is the mean over um, all the images in the training set as a function of the epochs, you know, for that training. Um, and you can see that as far as you go in epochs, you never end up with this uh, um, sign of overtraining like in the validation MSC. So you don't see the val validation MSC going up ever. It seems to track with the training uh, set. So yeah, this is perhaps not too surprising because the data is all perfectly consistent because there's no noise involved here, right? And But if we're going to solve the inverse problem, we need this. Oh, yeah. Now, the other evidence that, that causes us to stop the training here is if you look at the derivative of the loss function, the derivative in epochs is averaging around zero. So it seems like we are basically plateauing in the loss function at this set of epochs. So we might as well just stop. All right, so if we're gonna invert the problem though, we need this to go to zero, all right? So there's a couple of things that could be going wrong here. Maybe the models, um, you know, maybe the training or the optimization algorithm that does the training is not is like trapped in a local min or something like that. The other issue is that maybe the model itself is not flexible enough to drive the um, MSC to zero here. That's also a possibility. But in any case, if we're gonna invert the inverse problem, we need this to go to zero. So here's another kind of study that maybe uh, 
will give us evidence that it might be possible to solve the inverse problem. So we just took that um, set of uh, training data, you know, the image data samples, and just reduced the size of the set and, you know, backtrack here and look at what, what the RMSC would be, you know, on the test data if we use less training data. So if you use less training data, of course, the RMSC gets worse, right? But we want to see if we can use this curve to extrapolate to see how many images we'd need to get perfect recon. You know, so we need to extrapolate this curve to zero. And if we look at it, you can see that, um, you know, zero is very far away when we look at this trend here. So it could be zillions of images, all right? So um, we recognize though, this is just one study, right? You know, with one kind of neural network, with one type of object, you know? Um, so, and we're still interested in this problem. So we, what we've done now is we've uh, constructed a deep learning sparse UCT challenge. So I urge you all to, uh, to check out this web page. So we're about ready to launch this thing. So basically you're gonna get very similar data. I've modified a little bit just to make it uh, a little more challenging, but not a whole lot more challenging. And so we're hoping a lot of people will participate and try to, um, uh, you know, see if we can bring this RMSC curve down. All right. So the contest is basically who gets the lowest RMSC. All right. I don't want to require, um, you know, that you solve the inverse problem, you know, because again, the data set here is limited in size. So, um, so I think just with that limitation, all we want to do is just see what kind of neural network can people come up with just to get the lowest possible possible RMSC. All right. Um, so I think I have a couple more slides that I just want to show. So yeah, so let me just talk about the the um, evidence in the literature. All right. So I talked about this problem in quite some detail and the evidence you know, that you need to demonstrate that you're solving an inverse problem. But so what you actually see in the literature. So oftentimes what you see is this kind of thing where you have some CT image. So I'm just picking on this paper again. Uh, so you take the CT image as a ground truth and uh, generate data in subsamples. So this particular study, they're using 50 views, all right? And they're showing you FBP recon, total variation recon, and their proposed network. And they show that, well, this has the highest SNR. So this is like, a, SNR is like one over RMSC basically. All right, but when you're talking about inverting um, an inverse problem, this comparison doesn't matter whatsoever. All you care about, is this image the same as this one or not? All right, and you can clearly see if I look at these two ROIs, these images are different. All right, so this didn't solve the inverse problem, right? It can also get a little bit more confusing when you include um, results from different types of objects. So say here, yeah, TV is better than FBP, but in this real case, FBP, or this FBP net is better than TV. But again, you know, those are things that are irrelevant when you're talking about solving inverse problems. All you care about is this the same as this or not? And it shouldn't matter what the structure here is. If you're saying you're solving the problem just because it's a supposedly uh, easier uh, test here for TV, you still have to, and if you make the claim that you're solving the inverse problem here, this also has to solve in this case, and it's not, all right? And so just one more thing I'd, I'd like to cover in terms of uh, deep learning results. So. Lately, I've seen a few papers talking about robustness of deep learning, basically addressing stability without getting into the actual inverse, right? And so, um, so I grabbed these plots from this paper where it's okay, I'm getting away from CT a little bit because this is Fourier transform sampling of uh, image full of ellipses, all right? But um, yeah, close enough. All right, so, um, so basically what you see here is a study 
of the recovery of total variation versus a bunch of neural networks um, as a function of noise level in the data. So here's regular white noise, and this is what they call adversarial noise, which is designed to foul up the system as much as possible. All right, so the right side of these graphs is high noise, and then you're heading into to zero noise, all right? And in order for you to say that you're solving an inverse problem, basically this curve, you know, it just has to uh, decrease down to zero, all right? If you don't decrease down to zero, then you don't have this inequality. So your stability constant is infinity, all right? And so I just wanted to point this out, you know, it sort of gives this impression that these neural networks are stable because you see this decrease heading in the area of zero, but it has to actually come down to zero if you're gonna be talking about inverse problems, all right? So let me just conclude here for, First, let me talk about what we're not concluding, all right? We're not saying that deep learning and CNNs are not useful for tomographic imaging, all right? Obviously, if there wouldn't be so much work on this, right, if uh, they weren't useful, all right? So we're not saying that. And we're also not saying that they can't solve the inverse problem, you know? Just because we fail doesn't mean, or to fail to demonstrate it doesn't mean that it's not possible to solve the inverse problems in this way. So, and in fact, that's why, you know, we're motivated to like put out this challenge to see if, uh, you know, people, so if we can work towards this to deriving the inverse for the sparse view CT problem. But what we are concluding is we just don't see the evidence yet that CNN solved the CT related inverse problem. All right, I'll stop here now, Andreas. Emil, thank you for the presentation. So I have some applause for you. I hope you can hear it. Yeah, yeah, I can. Thank you. Thank you. So at least that you have the feeling that there is an audience and really people <laughs> listening. And so, right, that I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you. This was a, a, a very nice presentation. And there, there are a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, the first question is the, the phantom uh, the, for the breast phantom is essentially binary because you have the, the dense tissue and the non-dense. Right. And the question is whether this is, or this is optimal for the TV-based methods um, and whether mm. you think that influences some of the results. But you, I mean, later you also had from the Lodo CT challenge, right? And the, the observations are essentially similar on, on all of these data sets, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is a really important point. I know that, uh, you know, I put these images side by side for the TV and the CNN, but um, the purpose there is not to do a comparison between the two methods. So the, the purpose of having the total variation image is, is just to show a solution for a situation where we know we can get the solution, right? So, of course, you know, um, um, in general, you don't want to, uh, you know, the, the hope of the CNNs is that, or deep learning is that it's going to identify what's the right restriction on the images, right? and then give you the solution to the inverse problem, all right? But, uh, you know, the only way that I know in order to, to solve a sparse view CT inverse problems is using, the, you know, the gradient sparsity mechanism. So the problem is set up so that will succeed, all right? So it's just to define a problem that I know has a solution. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, will the deep learning technique find that solution? You know, it's not a, it's not a, this one's better than this one kind of thing. It's just to establish the framework. Yeah, I, I understand this. One thing that I'm a little worried about is if you uh, do, a, let's say, a FPP type re reconstruction, and yeah. then you apply the CNN on top, uh, it's also, we, we observed that also in, in some of our studies, that CNNs, mm -hmm. uh, in particular the, the unit type CNNs that have these skip connections and so on, they somehow behave very similar to a dictionary. So they like to replace things with what they have seen and some training data. 
And okay. in some occasions, we've seen some results where they are trying to or are making up things. So the, the, do, do you have any similar observations? I mean, there's not, there's not so many papers out there showing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've seen one or two where they really see hallucinations by the CNN right. type, um, approaches. Yeah, honestly, I'll tell you, I was expecting worse results. So um, this, let me, can I just share again my sure. uh, uh, screen? Um, so th that was the purpose behind the, doing this particular uh, presentation where we took all the 10 tra training or sorry, testing images and found, try to look for the worst case um, region of interest in all those uh, images. And that was this one. And so here you see uh, what you're talking about. It's a hallucination, you know, so you have this object here, which is not in the truth. Mm -hmm. But um, it's quite small, you know, it's only a few pixels uh, wide. And so I was expecting a lot worse uh, than that. Um, but still, yeah, it, it is, a, there is this uh, hallucination or what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just say then also for this uh, grand challenge that we're doing, um, we're providing not only the FBP images, but also the 128 view sinograms themselves. So if people want to try methods that don't for involve first doing the FBP, um, then the data is available for, for that. So mm. maybe you can avoid some of the issues you're talking about. Yeah, so the, it somehow has the risk that the data consistency is lost because you, right. you, you're, you're not making sure that you're only operating in, in the null space, but... Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and there's 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 nice papers by by Haltmeier and so on where where he puts in additional constraints that only mm -hmm. data that was never measured can be created by the uh, CNN type of approaches, which is uh, interesting. Uh, essentially, enforcing consistency or data consistency, uh, similar yeah. to to an iterative type of approach. Uh, th there's these automap type of reconstruction methods that directly take the input data and then mm -hmm. go through a deep network and directly output the yeah. reconstructions. What do you do? You think they're they're solving the reconstruction problem? Are they are they learning image reconstruction? Okay, that's a great question. So you know, so I don't know the details of how those things work, but I look at the papers and look at the results, and I don't see this kind of study where. Um, you know, you d demonstrate an error in the imaging that is tending towards zero. You know, I understand it's just like with iterative, you never actually get to zero, right? Because we have to do things numerically. But if there was some kind of set of studies which show, you know, like as you increase the amount of data, the image error is, is heading steadily towards zero so that you could like make a prediction that if I want to get to RMC of 10 to the minus six, I would need this much training data. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's what I'm looking for. But if I just see like a couple of images, you know, with, with you know, decent error, it's not a evidence that you're solving the most problem. Uh, you know? and it, it also brings up this point that the all the machine learning methods, they are essentially valid as long as you operate in the distribution of the training data. And mm. the, the test data is also distributed essentially from from the same right. source yeah. and as soon as something goes wrong here then these methods break badly right so yeah that's also an interesting point yeah uh, yeah so so for this study that's a we um uh you know and, and the challenge thing the everything's coming from the same stochastic process so at least we've eliminated that <laughs> that <laughs> issue, but uh, um, but yes, in the re in the real world, you have an issue there, right? Like, uh, what's uh, like how different can the uh, training data be from the test data? You know, and, and one stochastic source is the patient and pathology, and yeah. that's going to be really hard to model to be You're exhaustive. Right. Right. And then also the scanners, right? Because scanners also always input, print their particular artifacts, right? No matter how clean the scan is or how high the dose, or whatever, you still have artifacts and noise, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, also one interesting question that came up here in the chat is um, from from Esam. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Have you investigated the CNN performance if the data, uh, if the testing data is generated from slightly different number of projection views than from the training data? So if you have a different geometric setup. Uh, yeah, that is interesting. That, that's, um, I, I would assume that you also get these out of distribution problems, but I'm also mm -hmm. not sure. I'm, I never looked into mm -hmm. that. Myself. Yeah, I haven't looked into that particular thing, but but actually, um, uh, what we did look into, you know, that I see where this uh, conversation is sort of heading now, and so that's why we we um, had two classes of uh, images, you know, the smooth edge image and the binary one. So we did try things like training on the binary set and testing on the smooth edge set, you know, so it's sort of similar flavor question, and actually in the paper what we did. Um, we didn't show those results, but what we did is um, like did training with both set classes of uh, images and then tried it on both uh, an, a test set from the binary set and the smooth edge set, you know, mm -hmm. um, to see like how, you know, because you've expanded the space of possible images, like the, how bad does that affect the RMSE? And it turns out that the RMSE did not, um, you know, increase that much actually. So um, expanding the set did okay, but that's not quite the same thing as what you guys are talking about, where yeah, yeah, yeah. crossing over. Yeah. This, this because this is also a major issue in in the stability of the method then and the, right. The, yeah. What I what I can say is that. Um, one way was worse than the other. So like if you train on the binary and then put a smooth e uh, edge phantom, that gave a pretty crazy results. But the reverse was not as bad. If you train okay. on, on smooth and then uh, put in a binary Interesting. Uh, image. Yeah. Yeah. What what do you think about these approaches? Like like Thomas Pock has these variational networks where you essentially mm -hmm. unroll an iterative method, and then the only trainable part is like the regularizer, and it mm -hmm. is essentially mm -hmm. still a, an iterative um, compressed sensing type of solution right. scheme. But also in compressed sensing, you're never sure whether you have picked the right regularizer for that specific problem. So that sounds like a right, right, right. elegant solution to that. That's true. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that approach definitely has a possibility of, uh, being demonstrated to solve the inverse problem, you know? Um, so what I would like to see there is, um, for that approach. Okay. Uh, so like gradient sparsity, we understand that very well, right. You know, that matches up very well with CT, but you know, Perhaps if there's a different object model where, um, you know, you uh, you uh, suspect there's some sort of sparsity there, but it's definitely not on the gradient. You know, that's what I'd like to see is if it can uh, deal with that kind of problem. <laughs> you know, because I think he's done some things where he basically ended up learning a, a different, you know, a more precise form of total variation. So. I, I suspect if we did this test here, um, you know, with this data that we have, um, you know, basically you just learn something that looks like total variation, then you'd get, um, you know, the inverse. But then uh, what I'd like to see is like a different sort of, uh, you know, if it could identify different sort of um, low rank or structure or, you know, low, um, low dimensional structure, you know, that something that we're not familiar with. You know what I mean? We we had a quite interesting um, on a conference paper where we looked in not into few view but into limited angle, and then you okay. get oriented streaks, and turned right. out that the learned regularizer was quite uh, effective in suppressing streak structures with a certain orientation, because that is essentially a, a, a inherent to the geometry, right? Right, right. So, um, yeah. So that would be good to like study that in a, like in a real inverse problem setting, you know, where you can demonstrate, you know, that um, 
you know, uh, you can really recover the object, you know, I just, I know it's very, it's just theoretical, but, you know, the, it's just the cleanness of this inverse problem question is just, uh, is uh, kind of compelling, you know. Yeah, so the, the nice thing I think with, with Thomas Pock's approach is that it's also not having this nested unit type of regularizer, but it simply has a, a matrix multiplication and a shrinkage operation there. Which yeah. and also makes it compatible with the math that we know, and right. um, so you could oh, yeah. so, mm -hmm. you could analyze the basis, uh, but we yeah. we never did that. Um, well, so so um, let me ask. Uh, so with those unrolled approaches, is it possible to? Um, uh, I mean, is it really just like iterative, where you can just uh, go as many iter iterations as you like, or do you have to first say I'm only doing a hundred iterations and then? do the training based on that. Yeah, so what we did at the time is more like 10 iterations. Okay, <laughs> because, right, yeah. because sure. you have to keep the intermediate results in memory. But I think yeah. by now there have been quite a few tricks how to work with the, um, essentially with a recurrent cell that then would replace the, the iteration. So you could even put a, a regular um, mm -hmm. uh, condition to abort the iterations. So it, it should be possible, but I have to check that there, there have been like a year ago, quite interesting papers around how to save memory during the unrolling mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so on. So yeah, uh, interesting. I see. Yeah, so I got a couple of things to say on, on that. So one thing also is like, you know, this particular problem that we did is fairly large scale, right? It's like 512 by 512 images. So I think, you know, just to start, it would be interesting to look at a smaller scale you know, like 64 by 64, right? And see if you mm. get recovery there. Um, yeah, um, because at, at least, you know, you you don't have run into this memory issue. So that's what made, triggered that point in my mind, right? Is that, you know, you'd like to be able to go to higher iterations about the memory and stuff, but, um, you know, if you go to a smaller problem, then you can also get around that. Um, the other things, also, I have a couple of colleagues here that are also very interested in this iterative approach. You know, uh, Greg Anji and uh, Becca mm -hmm. Willett, you know, they, they're doing a lot of work also in the, this kind of unrolled iterative kind of thing. But definitely also apply, go for the, try it on the challenge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is the, when is the challenge going to start? What's the uh, so yeah I'm meeting with the web guy today so like within the next week the the web page will go, be up and then the do, the data will be downloadable on March March seventeenth that's when we okay. uh, um, set as the date you know when the you know you can get the training data and get started and then I think a kind of a a leaderboard is going to go up then on on March thirty first you know just to show where the different groups are you know in terms of RMSC, and then... Uh, Let's try whether we can get some overfits. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever has the greatest cluster wins, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is an exciting challenge, and I think this, this is um, really going to produce some interesting insights, because I'm also pretty sure that you will do a couple of statistical analysis on the results, and... Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, it should be really interesting, yeah. I mean, already the the first Lodo's CT reconstruction challenge had produced pretty interesting results. When did the first seven or eight methods essentially statistically insignificant? Uh, That's in right. Performance. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's and, right. And didn't Larry Zhang submit a bilateral filter or something like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think he might have got like uh, in the top five, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Really, really cool work. Um, Emil, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was really nice to see and also to catch up a little. Uh, so Yeah, yeah it was great to see you too. So. Th these new methods change our world. And I I'd like to thank you again for the discussion and your time. So I have another round of applause for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Thanks for coming over. Emil, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And you've seen that we also had a pretty nice discussion afterwards on all the possible benefits that deep learning reconstruction could bring to us, but also the risks. So if you still have any questions, 
please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. If you contact me via social media or even the comment function of this video, then I will forward your questions to Emil and we will get your questions answered. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did and I would be very much looking forward to welcoming you again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.